Well, since the beginning of the year, um, from January last. And we've uh, conducted a lot of um, demonstrations across the country, even abroad. We just recently come back from doing shows in the Costa del Sol, uh, Gibraltar. Um, before that, a while before that, we did a tour of Australia and New Zealand over six weeks. And we did all major cities. Um, we're doing a whole tour of Norway in the next tour, which encompasses, I believe, nine venues across Norway. Uh, we're going over to America again, and we're conducting stuff there, and also filming there. Yeah. So next year, this has been very busy, but next year is going to be manic. Mm -hmm. So I've got to try and keep my strength up. Yeah. <laughs> in plain terms, I am a conduit, if you like, a, an instrument, all mediums are instruments, between this world and the spiritual world, the spiritual realm. In other words, we listen and we, and we see if we are developed that way to see spirit people and also if we're fortunate enough to hear them as well. And within those two things, which I've, I've trained and developed for both clairvoyance and clairaudience for now 42 years. And I'm only just getting there now. <laughs> so when you hear about people who are suddenly overnight becoming mediums, uh-oh, watch out. And you get a lot of this, that these sorts of things happen on since the people have got the World Wide Web and stuff like that and people overnight could be a plumber yesterday. Hey, I'm an international medium today. You got to watch out for that. And this is where we get the word when pe people uh, honestly uh, test um, not so much mediumship, but test the validity of the person who's purporting to be a medium. So I'd always say, you know, if a person wants to go and have a sitting with a medium who's developed, trained and has walk the walk over the years through experience, then they're likely to get the truth of a link, but not with the lesser. Mm. It wouldn't even be hit and miss. A lot of it would be coming from the brain. That's why a lot of people are disappointed if they go to a supposedly medium and they get a load of nonsense. Mm. It's no wonder that leaves a stain. But then again, I've always said, in every walk of life, to charlatanism, or well, doctorate, mm. priesthood, dentists. You got good, bad, and everything, haven't you? Mm. So, they tailor us because we think, you know, this whole saying that's been going on for nearly fifty years with me. Well, you know, you, if you've got these gifts, you should be giving these gifts out free, and people say, I say, yeah, okay. You're interviewing me. Can I ask you a question? This is the interviewer. Can I ask you a question? Of course. You get a salary per year? Yes. Now, I'm not going to ask you. Be so naughty to ask you how much you earn. But if you were to go and train and develop into what you are now, and your governors, your bosses said, you're going to work for free because this is your vocation. Who's going to look after your family? Are you married, man? Yes. Have you got children? Yeah. Who's going to pay for the schooling? Who's going to pay for the house if you've got a mortgage? Who's going to pay for, put food on the tables? Who's going to look after the medical care? Medium's no different than anyone else. Mm. So when I hear those stories and I get interviewed all over the world, that's what I say. If you conduct and you commit yourself, as I have done over the years, I've got to be earning enough money to look after my family. My children, my uh, grown children now, and my grandchildren, my lovely wife, my animals that I've got, they've got to be fed. So all this nonsense, you should do it free. Oh, come on, be in the real world, will you? Well, I, I'm hoping and that's all we can do. We can't command spirit, we can't demand them. But generally, if um, it's conducted properly, we do manage to get loved ones coming across the veil for the evening for some of these lovely people out here. And hopefully it will be it's an amazing amount of things that happen in a, a demonstration. I find that a lot of people when I speak, I always speak to people after the show, always, and get their views Have they enjoyed it. That's the people who've maybe got a connection on the night, even people who haven't. And if I hear from the people who haven't, they still enjoyed the, the night thoroughly and they got something from it. Wow, I'm working. For the people who do, wonderful. Some of the things they say, you've closed this for me. 
I've had this problem with the worry of an individual for 12 years. You closed it for me tonight. Now I can live on. There are people who come here probably who have got ailments. I always ask for healing, for people to go to people while they're here, to give them improvement, and it works. There's so many things happen on an evening because the lovely people tell you so. Um, when I get that feed, I know really before I even get that feedback, I know if I work properly and thoroughly and honestly as a medium, I know by the end of that evening that yes, people have gained things. And gained, some people gained so many things. You can imagine if a lovely lady sitting here, maybe a son, just an example, lost his life in a tragic circumstance and not so long back. The hurt, there's no healing going on there for that poor lady. If that son can come through, use me as a conduit to say, Mum, I'm fine. I'm with Grandma and Grandad and name them and the family members. That gives this extra strength. And also the sons, they, you haven't lost me, Mum. I'm around you a lot. Haven't you noticed so and so in the home at times? And the, the lady will answer, yes, well, that was me. Because you can't see me, you can't hear me, it doesn't mean to say I'm not there. And I'll cause a commotion, I'll knock, make noises, I'll bring fragrances into the air, just to draw attention. My clothes that you've still got, did you not find them in disarray the other day? Yes, that was me. All these things. It's not so much a validation, um, it's to say, to strengthen also, if this bit, you get a lot of people who have no belief system whatsoever in any orthodoxy of religion, that's okay. It's a world for everyone to decide for themselves. We're not here to convert <laughs> in any way. All I say is, I've walked the walk, it's been proven to me, and in my family before me, my grandmother and her mother, and enough so for me to make a statement many year ago, years ago that I'm going to work for Spirit until I finish. I'm not going to retire. I'm retirement age now. Oh, I've got plenty of years to walk the walk yet because I want to still conduct with conviction, passion and compassion. Well, I sit in the quiet in the dressing room, make sure no one's there with me. And I just go into what we call a slight meditative period of time. I drop the thoughts. In other words, I liken it to a glass, any type of glass. Fill that glass up it's to the top. As I link into that, that spiritual side of my nature is filling up. When I arrive at that point, I know it. And then I'm open to spiritual influence, they can come close. They know it, but I've got to conduct that. It's a prayer of invocation, asking for also protection of any negative influence whatsoever to take place in this theater. And I always point out to the loved ones as well that around this perimeter now, right now setting, will be spiritual envoys who'll stand and make sure no negative influence infiltrates this love that's coming through, okay? So that gives them that knowledge of protection. I feel great. I feel fabulous. I feel, hey, yes. Because then I want to convey what that spirit person is saying. I'm always quietly thanking when I'm on that stage after one person or the other, I'm always thanking, you don't hear me. I'm saying thank you. Thank you for allowing them to come, thank you. So I think they know in spirit that I'm very appreciative. There's no command, there's no demand. We've got to take it into consideration. Even though we're of the spirit body, not of the physical anymore, an ethereal body, contained within our being, our eternal being, which is the spirit, not the physical, we still retain our way of, for want of a better word, our way of thinking, our personality stays intact. It doesn't change. Just because we transport ourselves on the journey to go to the new sort of life, if you like, where we've earned the right to go to. 
it doesn't stop any of the way we've thought prior to going over. So your personality, if you're an exuberant, uh, an extrovert character, as in life, or an introverted character, or in the middle of the road, you'll come through that way. That's when loved ones will say, oh my God, that's the way he was, that was his mannerism, that's what he said, that's how we used to do. And all we're doing is copying, we're pointing to them. There's no words that come from my mouth that's coming from my brain, so to speak, to reason things out. I listen and I deliver what they want me to say. I was in my grandmother's house and my grandmother was a very, very good, loving, loving medium for 54 years. Her mother before her, her great-grandmother and sister, where it goes way back in my family. But I always remember the first experience I was in Grand's. I was with mum at Grand's visiting and whatever. And um, uh, she lived in one of these big old Victorian houses, so many landings. And when we used to go to Grand's, we used to be sent, there was three of us at the time, Colin, my elder brother, Barbara, my elder sister, by a year or so used to be sent right to the top to the attic that had been changed and to, like a playroom for us until we got cold because when we used to go down we'd have dinner there or evening meal and so the kids would be thrown up there we'd play and then we'd get called to come down we got the call from grandmother <coughs> Colin being the eldest down the stairs first the three or four landings Barbara after me me being the youngest I was the last one to get to the last level landing they call them and I heard this door bang on the door and a shuffling and I turned and I froze and there was a man standing in the doorway I could see him as clearly as I can see you now in the physical I saw the clothes he was wearing <coughs> and I froze because I suppose the age I was I couldn't determine whether physical um, spiritual, all I knew that there was a strange man in front of me. What was going through my mind was how can this man come into my grand's house? Has he got a key? He's a stranger. And I wanted to run down to tell Gran and Mum. But I was just transfixed. I was, I, I was frightened. And the next thing it was like, he spoke, he said two things to me. But he mentioned a word, a name called Richard. Go and tell Grandma Richard. So I ran down the stairs, mum and grandma were in the kitchen area preparing the food and I'm trying to t tell them there's a strange man upstairs in the bedroom and gran just put everything down and she must have thought he's seen someone. Can you explain some what this, better still she said, you come in, she went into the room where the table was set, we were going to have our meal and she went and said you sit down there. She goes to the old cupboard, brings this old round tin box with a lid on it, which I'd never seen before, and emptied the contents onto the tablecloth. And she said, have a look. And all that you could see was images, people of head and shoulders, fully, you know, full photographs. Tell me if you can see the man. And very briefly, I saw the man in three photographs. One would you believe in? In the three-piece suit I saw him there, like a charcoal grey. And Gran looked at them, well, I watched the two of them looking at each other and said, don't you worry, this is Gran's word at the time because I suppose she took into consideration I was only a child and I couldn't understand this business of, she couldn't tell me at that age, this was a ghost, a spirit person, not only a spirit person, but a person who was belonging to our family. And what I'd seen, who I'd seen, was my grandfather, Richard, who gave me the name, who passed over two and a half years before I was born. Didn't know anything about him as a kid. So Gran knew then, I was the next one taken after her. I had the gifts, not Barb, not Colin. So I was taken under her wing from there on in. In fact, I used to stay after finishing school on a Friday. Every Friday night, Gran would collect me. And it was a distance, about 11 mile difference to where we lived at the time. And I used to go and stay with Gran. And I've had experiences that she'd openly say, did you experience anything last night? So yeah. So she helped me. And then when I was at the time she knew, she sat me down and explained to me the whole process, why this was happening. <coughs> After the reaction, a couple of years later, I openly said to my gran, in honesty, I don't want to be like you, gran. 
I don't want to see ghosts. I don't want to see spooks. I don't want to see spirits. What I had in my mind as a, by then a nine year old boy, I was sport. I love sport. And all I wanted to be was a footballer. That was my dream. And she said, I always remember that you will be a footballer. But eventually, you will pick up what I've left off. I said, OK. Well, she pointed it all out that I'd play or be selected by a side who were red and white. And I signed for Liverpool Football Club as a 13-year-old schoolboy. And at 15, apprentice pro. And at 17, full-time pro. And I thought that was my career. It wasn't to be. I was OK. Run the mill. I wasn't a Georgie Best. Although I played against him, he kicked me. <laughs> he sent me to hospital, stood on my ankle, yeah. That was Georgie Bass, great player. It was too fast, it was too fast. I had to mark him, like the wind. He'd jink in there and he'd jink in there and then come jump down on you. And you go, oh God. But anyway, I'm going off the point. Um, I forgot what I was going to say then. I was back at Mason football. Um, so yeah, um, after a number of years playing football, I was still developing my gifts. Still seeing spirit people. If I went into people's homes, could see someone and I'd tell them. Uh, a lot of people were appreciative of it. Um, <clears throat> but I remember one time I told um, Emlyn Hughes, who was a Liverpool footballer, he would become a very good friend of mine. He's since passed over, bless him. <clears throat> I told Emlyn in training one morning, um, it just came out to me, we were running around just warming up and I said, Emlyn, have you got a car? And he said, no, I'm going for one tomorrow, a new one. I said, right. So I said, will it be a blue colour? And he said, yeah, okay. Why? Now Emlyn didn't know I was developing this. Emlyn knew me as a footballer. And up to that time, I'd never said anything to any of the staff, any of the first teamers, Ian St. John, all those people. And I said, just be careful when you pick the car up. And he said, why? And I said, because that road you're going to be driving on, that was my excuse, can be quite dangerous at times. So just be careful. You're weird, you, he said. And off we carried on training. Well, sure enough, the next day, him and Bob Paisley, who was the head coach, who later became manager, and uh, a young coach called Ruben Bennett, Scotsman, they went with him to pick his car up. And they were driving back to the training ground. And an articulated lorry spun round at the set of lights and whacked him in the car, side on, over into the pavement, and rolled them over. They rolled, okay. They had a couple of cuts, but they were, now, I got into deep trouble there because by the time they got back to the training ground, they told Bill Shankly, the great Bill Shankly, the manager, what I'd said. So I'm training, warming up, and get called by Joe Fagan, who was assistant coach. The boss wants to see in the pavilion. Come on, run to it. So, oh God, what's it? The boss want me. I, it didn't dawn on me what it was going to be. And I got, even though I'm what I am. I get in there and he's sitting at his big desk and alongside him is uh, Reuben Bennett there and he's got Bob Paisley there and Emlyn there. Emlyn looking at me like this. So the boss said, because that's what we called him. Right, son, Scots, broad Scotchman. Oh, son, he said, he said, tell me what you've been saying to Emlyn yesterday. And I went, oh, no. So I looked, I said, do you have an accident? He went, uh, immediately I said, it wasn't my fault. That's what I did in my defensive. It wasn't my fault. And I explained to the boss what it was. That I had the gifts and I'm taken after my grandma and I did see an accident, but I tried not to, you know. And he said, okay, all right. Well, let me tell you, he said, you are a Liverpool footballer, not, and that's what he called it, not at one of these psychos, meaning a psychic. Liverpool football. Be proud of it. You're at the greatest club in the world. And if one day you want to play for the first team, that's what you are when you're here. And leave all that old ooby jooby stuff away from the training ground. And if you never see things with people, don't you tell them. I said, I promise I won't. And that's a fact, I think I was crying. 
I was ashamed. I felt. Anyway, get back to no. You stay. He said, uh, "Okay, uh, Joe, Ruben, and uh, Bob Paisley, get back with the players. Take them through the train. You stay here with me, young man." He said. So I thought, "Oh no, more." Anyway, the moment the, the, the men went, he said, come around here. He was acting like a father then. And I, I calmed down, he said, look, and he put it on, he said, look, you can't help doing what you're doing. Let me tell you, my wife, Nessie, comes from a family like you come from. Her mother was one of what you are, and her mother before. And Nessie used to say to me, it's real. Anyway, he said, like I asked you before, son, you're a footballer. You love being a footballer. I said, oh, yeah, that's what I want. Okay, well, put that other stuff aside and concentrate on your training and playing for the greatest club. I said, I will, boss, I will, boss, I will. Anyway, he said, come here. And he hugged me. I thought, oh, yeah. So as I'm going out, he said, oh, back, son, back, back, Derek, Derek. He said, we're playing Everton a week Saturday. How are we going to get home? Fantastic man, an ambassador to football and every player at Liverpool Football Club right the way down from the first team players to the juniors loved him. We loved him with a passion and um, yeah, so that was my experience and my memories with the great Bill Shankly. Um, unlike at live, uh, I've enjoyed it, I've enjoyed it, I've enjoyed the challenge. Um, I didn't ever seek it out. These television people came to me, like radio. I wasn't interested in what well, I was doing my work. Uh, I developed also in spiritualist churches. So I used to do private readings for people. And I used to do that seven days a week. That's how I suppose I earned my living because I went full time. And yeah, I remember Granada, uh, one of the head directors, um, uh, phoned our house and said, how they got the number, I don't know. But my wife answered because I was in the car going to my office in Liverpool because we'd moved to Southport and it was ooh, about before nine o'clock about half past eight. Derry, you just had a call from Granada, Granada, it's television, yeah. Why? Well, they want to speak to you about coming on one of their programmes. Me? What for? Anyway, I said, I'll give you your office number. Uh, I said, you're getting around nine o'clock. We'll just answer your phone. I said, I did. And she phoned about five past nine and said to me, I want you to come in on a live one hour program where you'll sit with the presenter, uh, Becky Wong, who turned out to be a lovely person, lovely soul. I worked with her for five and a half years. That's a lovely soul. I was very fortunate. Anyway, um, I sat with her and uh, what did they want me to do? They wanted me to read tea leaves from a cup that Becky had been drinking from and see what I could say and I thought, I don't read tea leaves. My grandmother used to do that. I don't, do, I, don't know how, I don't know how to do it. So they said to me on the phone, well, do what you do, but make out to the viewers that you're getting it from the cups. I said, okay, it's cheating that. No, it's not. You're still using your gifts if you've got gifts. I said, okay. I went along. And I remember being introduced to Becky. That was just shaking from here to there. I thought, I saw all these banker cameras, five of them cameraman and I'm going oh my god and we had a small audience as well uh, so they brought the cup in Becky did this went through the motions the tea leaves and I, I just did what I had to read up would you believe that's the truth of it what you did to read tea leaves by another, another learned person on this and apparently you get the person to do this you turn the cup up side down onto the saucer and spin it round anti-clockwise, turn the cup up like this, and then look in. Now, there were people in my grandma's days and before that used to rely doing it that way. I'd never experienced that, it's in spirit direct, but um, so I did it. So I suppose it was a, not a cheat, but a slight bending of the truth. But we arrived at the truth, because when I told Becky what I was seeing in there, I described a husband, I got his name, then I saw a little blonde boy and named him Isaac, that was a little son. And it blew her away. This is on live TV. So she immediately says to the people up in the gallery, they've got all the cameras up there, who's told him, come on, is it you? Told him all this stuff backstage, you know. No, 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 no. And then I told her a few more things. Then the spiritual thing happened.
in the studio. Right at the back of her was this little lady from Spirit. And she started speaking to me and I'm going, oh my God. Anyway, she said, you just tell her these couple of things. So I said, there's a lady with you. And she said, where, where? I said, so you're right. I can't feel nothing. And this is on live TV around 7 p.m. at night. And I said, well, look, even though you can't see her, just let me tell you what she's saying. And then you tell me. She said, you can see me as I was when I got older and I was quite a heavy set lady, but in my younger years, I was such a slim girl. I was a ballerina, you know? So I, I mentioned all this to her. This lady said she was a ballerina. She, I said, but in her older life, she put weight. Yeah, yeah, yes. And I said, and then she just told me she's your grandma. Oh my God, well, she started crying. And that's what caused me to be invited onto television after that first experience. And I did all kinds of shows for Granada uh, before I moved on five, six years later to Most Haunted for five years and then other things I did for Living TV. So, but I've never ever once asked or went to these people. They asked me. What's your favorite pizza topping? Oh, yeah. Um, Yes, <laughs> yes, he knows it. Uh, the meat feast is me. I love it. Yeah, I love it. Pa uh, the sausage as well, you know, the pa uh, pepperoni, is it? Pepperoni. Pepperoni. Mm.